Hello and welcome back. In the previous video, we discussed the Compton effect, which describes this phenomenon where these photons which make up light can actually collide with electrons in exactly the same way that two particles could collide. And so what this illustrated was that light, which we know is a wave phenomenon because it exhibits interference, uh, can also exhibit some of these particle-like properties. And in this video, we're going to talk about how particles can also sometimes exhibit wave properties. So not only can waves exhibit particle-like properties, but particles can also exhibit wave-like properties. And we call this uh, the particle-wave duality, and it's a very semi-classical kind of idea. And one of the very important discoveries that led to this idea of a particle wave duality was this experiment that was performed by two people who were working for Bell Labs named Davison and Germer. And in 1925, they were working on trying to improve the vacuum tube. And let me just explain briefly what a vacuum tube is. So the basic idea behind a vacuum tube is that you're trying to come up with some way that you can amplify a signal with a very small controlling voltage. And the way that you do this is that you take an emitter, so this is just like the experiment that was performed by Philip Leonard. So you have this metal plate here, this is called the emitter, and then you have another plate that's called the collector. And when uh, Philip Leonard had done this experiment, he connected these two plates to a very large voltage source, and that basically ripped these electrons off of the emitter and caused them to fly over to the collector. And what people had discovered at the early part of the 20th century is that another way that you could achieve this is by heating up the emitter. So you take this heating element and you make this, this emitter very, very hot. And basically what happens is that, if you remember, a, a piece of metal, we can treat this as a box full of electrons. These electrons are all just flying around. So if you heat up the metal hot enough, these electrons will be moving fast enough that some of them can actually escape from this metal surface. And this is called thermionic emission. And sometimes physicists will describe this as boiling off electrons because this is exactly analogous to uh, what happens to water molecules when you boil water. The water molecules have so much energy that they actually jump off the surface of the water and go into the air. And that's exactly what's happening in this thermionic emission. So you've got these electrons in the metal and you're heating them up so much that some of them basically just jump off the metal. And so if you apply even a small voltage between these two plates, so if I supply a very small positive voltage here and a very small negative voltage here, these electrons will be attracted to the collector plate. And this is what's called a diode circuit. So this is a vacuum tube diode. And basically what this does is it only allows current to flow in one direction. So the current can go from the emitter to the collector, but because the collector is not hot, the electrons can't jump off of the collector and go towards the emitter. And you can use this as an amplifier by putting something in between, which is called a gate. And basically, this is just this wire mesh, and you hook this up to another voltage source. And the idea is that if I apply a positive voltage to this gate, then any of the electrons which are emitted by the emitter are going to get collected at the gate instead of the collector. So by applying even a very small positive voltage here at the gate, I can stop any current from flowing from the emitter to the collector. So by doing this, I can apply relatively small voltages to control the current that flows between the emitter and the collector. And so by doing this, you can actually build up these very, very powerful amplifiers. And this is the basic idea behind a vacuum tube. And in 1925, Davison and Germer were experimenting with the vacuum tube. And basically what they were doing was they were doing something very similar to what Leonard had done. So they were taking this emitter plate and this collector plate, and they were just shooting electrons from the, the emitter over towards the collector. And when they did this, they discovered that if you look behind the collector plate, that some of these electrons will actually pass through the collector, and they'll create an interference pattern behind the collector plate. So you'll get this interference pattern, and the interference pattern that shows up is exactly the same type of interference pattern that you would get if you shined x-rays on a metal plate. So this is an interference pattern that's the same type of interference pattern that you get if you shine waves on the metal plate. And so what this suggests, of course, is that these electrons are somehow acting like waves, right? That's the, 
the uh, defining characteristic of waves is that they exhibit this uh, interference phenomenon, this superposition phenomenon. And so this was a, a very significant discovery because, of course, people knew that electrons were particles, but now they were seeing this very definitive evidence that really showed that these electrons were acting like waves. And it turns out that the explanation behind what was going on in this Davis and Germer experiment had already been hypothesized in 1924 by another physicist named Louis de Broglie. And what de Broglie was trying to do is he was trying to explain what was going on inside atoms. And in order to explain this, he hypothesized that, well, since light can sometimes act like a particle with an energy that's given by this formula and a momentum that's given by this formula, maybe particles can sometimes act like waves. And we can find the frequency and wavelengths by just rewriting these formulas. So the frequency of a de Broglie particle has a uh, frequency that's equal to the energy of the particle divided by Planck's constant. And a de Broglie wave has a wavelength that's equal to Planck's constant divided by the momentum of the particle. And when we talk about particles, so when we're talking about things like protons and neutrons and electrons, we, disc we call these waves a de Broglie wave. So the wave that describes an electron is called a de Broglie wave. And the frequency and wavelength are called the de Broglie frequency and the de Broglie wavelength. Now one thing that's very, very important to understand about the de Broglie waves, which we use to describe particles, is that this relationship, which we talked about when we discussed waves, that the speed of a wave is equal to its frequency times its wavelength, this equation does not hold for de Broglie waves. So we cannot say that the de Broglie frequency times the de Broglie wavelength is equal to the velocity that the particle is moving. And let me just go ahead and just show you that this won't mathematically work out. So this idea of velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength. Well, for a de Broglie particle, we have energy is equal to Planck's constant times frequency. So frequency is equal to if the particle is just moving in free space, this energy is the kinetic energy of the particle. So this is one half mv squared divided by Planck's constant. So that's my frequency. And remember that the momentum is given by Planck's constant divided by wavelength. So the de Broglie wavelength is equal to h divided by momentum. And for a particle, momentum is equal to mass times velocity. So if I plug the de Broglie frequency and the de Broglie wavelength into this formula, I'll see the velocity is equal to, so we'll have 1 half mv squared divided by Planck's constant for my frequency. And the momentum is going to be equal to, or I'm sorry, the wavelength will be equal to Planck's constant divided by mv. So the Planck's constants cancel. m cancels. This velocity cancels with one of these velocities. And I see that this is equal to half the velocity of the particle. So in fact, this didn't work out, right? I started with V is equal to frequency times wavelength, and I found that that's equal to half the velocity of the particle. So this didn't work out. And you may wonder, well, why doesn't this work? Well, remember that this formula that we came up with, this velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength, when we came up with that formula, we were talking about a very specific type of wave. We were talking about sciosoidal waves, waves that look like this. And when we're talking about sciosoidal waves, this equation still holds. So even for a de Broglie wave, if you had a sciosoidal de Broglie wave, you could still say velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength. But when we talk about particles, particles are not described by sciosoidal waves. Particles are described by distributions that look like this. And so, well, how do we describe distributions that look like this in terms of waves? Well, remember that uh, if, you, if you were in my class, uh, I actually showed this as a demonstration. So if I had a distribution that looks like this thing at the top of the screen, I can actually write this by summing together a whole bunch of other waves. So at the bottom of the screen, I show, I think, like 10 different waves. And I'm adding these waves together to get this distribution that's at the top of the screen.
And if I keep adding sine and cosine terms, I can make this look even more and more like a distribution. So an electron or a proton or any kind of de Broglie wave, it's really described by a sum of a very large number of sine and cosine waves. And the speed that this distribution is moving at is not given by this equation that velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength. And actually, let me just open up a blank screen here. I don't want to go into this too much, but it turns out that you can describe the velocity that the distribution moves at. And that's called the group velocity. And the group velocity is equal to the derivative of the angular frequency divided by, I'm sorry, with respect to the wave number. And the angular frequency, remember that's 2 pi times the frequency, and the wave number is 2 pi divided by the wavelength. So if you plug into this the de Broglie frequency and the de Broglie wavelength, and you take this derivative, you can actually show that this will give you the velocity for the particle. So this is actually how you would calculate the velocity of an electron in terms of these de Broglie waves. And I show this in my notes online. I don't want to go over this a whole lot because obviously this is involving calculus and it's well beyond anything that you need to know for this class. But I, just, I, I think the important thing to really understand is that first of all, you cannot use this equation, velocity is equal to frequency times wavelength, to calculate the velocity of a particle. So you can't take the de Broglie frequency and multiply it by the de Broglie wavelength to find the velocity of a particle. That equation does not work. The second thing is I think it's important just to understand why that didn't work. So the reason, the very basic overall reason that this equation doesn't work is because these de Broglie waves, when we're talking about things like electrons and protons, they're not sciusoidal waves. And this equation is only valid for sciusoidal waves. So when you want to describe a distribution that's not a sciusoidal wave, this is the type of equation that you have to use. And understanding how to do these types of calculations, that's something that's beyond uh, what we need to know for this class. So let's take a look at an example of something that you do need to know for this class. So this example says, a beam of electrons is traveling at a speed of 1.0 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And this beam of electrons is directed towards two slits which are separated by 10 nanometers. And the question asks us to find the angle for the first order interference peak. So basically what we need to do is we need to use the de Broglie equation to find the wavelength for these electrons and then we're going to use that de Broglie wavelength in the usual double slit formula. So remember that when we have two slits, constructive interference is going to occur when d sine theta is equal to an integer times a wavelength. And for the first order peak, this m is going to be equal to 1. So we can just set that equal to 1. So really, all we need to do for this problem is figure out the wavelength of these electrons, and then it'll be very straightforward to solve for this angle theta. So how do we calculate the wavelength? Personally, in my opinion, I don't really recommend uh, memorizing the formulas for the de Broglie wavelength and the de Broglie frequency. I prefer to remember the formulas for the energy of a photon and the momentum of a photon. And then if you need to know the de Broglie frequency or the de Broglie wavelength, you can use those equations to calculate that. So for an electron, we have the energy is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency, and the momentum is equal to Planck's constant divided by the wavelength. Since I'm interested in the wavelength, I'm going to use the second equation and rewrite it in terms of the wavelength. So the wavelength is equal to Planck's constant divided by momentum, or Planck's constant divided by m times v. So this is really, I think, the best way to approach this. Instead of trying to memorize four equations, I mean, this equation that I have written here is the same as this de Broglie wavelength formula I have written to the right. I just solved it for the wavelength instead of in terms of the momentum. So now I have a way to calculate this de Broglie wavelength. So the de Broglie wavelength is equal to Planck's constant. Remember, Planck's constant is a really small number. It's 6. Point, oh, let me look this up. I have it written down. It's 6. Point, I think 6.2. Yes, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules seconds. And then we have the mass of an electron, which is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms and the velocity was 10 to the fifth meters per second. 
So if we plug these numbers into a calculator, we'll see that this de Broglie wavelength is equal to 7.27 times 10 to the minus 9 meters per second. And now that we know the wavelength, we can easily plug this into this formula for uh, a double slit experiment. So if I rewrite this, I can say sine of theta is equal to the wavelength divided by d. So theta is equal to arc sine of the wavelength divided by d. I plug my de Broglie wavelength into this. d, remember, was 10 nanometers. Remember, a nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters. So if I plug this into here, I'm going to see that this is equal to 46.7 degrees. So that is the angle at which the first order uh, constructive interference occurs when I shine these electrons at these double slits. So we're actually seeing this very wave-like phenomenon, this interference pattern for a double slit with these electrons, which we know are particles. And so this is really a, a kind of a typical uh, type of problem that you would be asked to solve on either the AP exam or in the homework or on my tests. It's basically just applying uh, the formulas for the de Broglie wavelength and the de Broglie frequency to answer these types of basic wave questions. So anything that we've talked about uh, earlier in the year about waves, that's going to be fair game. And then the only additional steps that you'll have to take is using these formulas to calculate either the frequency or the wavelength of these uh, de Broglie waves. And this is really all that I want to say about these de Broglie waves. And in the next video, we're going to go just a little bit deeper, and we're going to talk a little bit about something called the Schrodinger equation, which is this underlying theory which describes basically everything that we've talked about in semi-classical so far. And in particular, I'm going to focus on a very important phenomenon called the uncertainty principle, which is something that comes out of uh, Schrodinger's equation.